So my name, John Forte. I, uh, I did a radio interview a few months ago. It was on Sirius Satellite Radio, on Eminem Station, in fact. Some of you know who Eminem is, others may not. Eminem is a rapper uh, from Detroit. He now has a radio station on Sirius Satellite Radio. I was being interviewed, and the interviewer said to me at one point, your parents must be really, really proud of you. And I thought she was being facetious. You never know with, with interviewers. You never know if they're taking a jab at you, if it's subtle, or if, if she was being genuine. And I said, well, how do you mean? She said, through it all, through all of your ups, through all of your downs, you've clearly got your head screwed on straight. And you should, you, you, your parents must be very, very proud of you. And I said to her, I said, well, despite um, having a pretty good name, which is John Forte, which is the name I, I was born with, it's not a stage name, the only thing that I have to thank my father for is for giving me that name because my father left when I was six months. So I never knew my dad. And I'm a junior. So here you have John Edward Forte Jr. occupying tiny space on the planet, but with, without the person who uh, he was named after, or whom he was named after, or after whom he was named. <laughs> I know, I got some smart folks in the room there. They're taking notes, mm-hmm, yes, yes. And that takes me to my beginning, Brownsville, Brooklyn. Brownsville never ran, never will, that's what we said, and that's what we still said. My mom is a magnificent, strong, powerful, little lady. She's about 4'11". She says she used to be 5'1", <laughs> but you shrink. That's what she says. She, she says one day you will shrink and you'll know what I'm talking about. My mother was not a musical person per se, although she attempted to sing to the eight tracks on Sundays as she cleaned up the apartment. She was an encourager. If I came home and I said, Mom, I want to paint, she looked through the newspaper and she'd find a way for me to paint. And that summer, I was at the Brooklyn Museum painting in a class, taking the train back and forth, painting. I come home with the oil on canvas. Mom, this is my painting. It's horrible, but it's my painting. It's not horrible, it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing I've seen. She takes the little nail and she, she hammers a nail through the painting, but, but she hangs it, you know? She, she got the point across. <laughs> You're ruining the tree, but it's beautiful. We gotta hang it. So for years, I had some of the most wretched artwork occupying our walls because my mother refused to take it down because she believed in her son and she wanted her son to believe in himself. One day I came home with a violin. And uh, my mother said, what's that? I said, it's a musical instrument. Check it out, it's a violin. Why do you have it? Well, I, I wanna learn how to play the violin. <laughs> my mother said, okay, when you practice, go in your room and close the door. <laughs> I'll be out here. <laughs> and she put up with it. But as opposed to it just being a, a, a summer long affair, it stayed with me for many, many years. And I ended up becoming the best, the best violinist in my school orchestra. And that was primary school, and that was when I was eight. When I went to junior high school, I, my, my, my reputation as a violinist preceded me. And it's kind of like one of those bad B movies where competitive kids compete against each other, and you know, I felt like somebody was trying to sabotage me. It was probably the the first violinist at the new school, I'd open the violin to play something and a string would pop or, or, or the bow would break. Kids will be kids, what do you do? But I, I stuck with it. And there was something that resonated with me, not necessarily about the violin, as much as my ability to make music or my ability to accompany other music that I was a fan of. So I could turn on the radio and listen to Madonna or the Sugar Hill Gang and play along with it. I was a part of the band. 
Madonna did not know I was a part of her band. <laughs> but it did not matter because I was creating something. Somewhere in the midst of right or wrong Is it worth that price to write a song When the road is so long And it's hard to see Despite hardships we surely felt We played with the cards we were dealt And though the earth got warm The ice didn't melt for me Skies light up Keep our dreams right side up No, it's not too far, far now We're almost where we are Look up ahead, there we, we are. In place of the word she failed to vent, the face gave away the heart's intent. Are you still hell bent on changing time? Guilt builds up and weighs the soul. It's tempting to yearn for days of old Well, if you play your role Then I'll play mine Skies light up Keep our dreams right side up No, it's not too, too Far now, we're almost where we are. Look up ahead, there we we are. Took a trip to a far, far land. We stood on words we couldn't understand. Everything. You said I wanted to hear In whispered words, seeds were sown Eagerly awaiting news from home No, I'm not gone, I'm just not there And should it be unclear Know that this is not your fight one way or another, I'll return by your side Until, until we see our skies light up Keep our dreams right side up No, it's not too Almost where we are. Look up ahead, there we we are. There we we are. There we we are. I told you I wasn't going to belt out, and, and, I, and I, I, may, I see.
That's me being bad. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm kidding. I'm just keeping you on your toes. Yeah, make this thing good. But it wasn't just about music. Uh, it was also about my education. I start speaking about my education, and, and something invariably happens when there are young people in the room. And I might add right now that I'm so happy to see such a diverse looking room. We've got some young people in here. We've got some brown people in here. We've got some estrogen and some testosterone. Um, so it's, it's amazing to look out here and so, to see so many different faces and, and, and spirits. I know that diversity transcends just the, the superficial. But when I start talking about education, young people sometimes slouch like, now he's gonna talk about do your homework and the importance of rote memorization. I'm actually not going to talk about the importance of rote memorization. Um, but I'm going to talk about the importance of critical thinking. I, I had a conversation while I was on my way uh, over here. Uh, and the topic of critical thinking came up. My mother could not be in the classroom with me she was, uh, like I said, a single parent of two, working diligently day in and day out to provide for my sister and me. So she couldn't always make sure that I did my homework. So it was, we had a relationship with trust. It was my job to do my homework and step up to the plate, and it was her job to feed me. I don't think she ever threatened to not feed me if I didn't do my homework. <laughs> but I, I got the gist. It was, it was a contract. What my mother could do in lieu of checking my homework and looking over my shoulder was speak to me. She was and remains a great communicator. And there's nothing quite like a conversation to stimulate critical thinking. I would ask her, Mom, why? How? And she loved books. So the next thing I know, the next day, that she'd come home from work and she spent $5.99, read this. So instead of answering it for me, she taught me to be resourceful. And I had a love affair with, with, with literature and with words and with doing my research and going to the library. Granted, I didn't always go to the library to do the right thing. It was, it was a nice meet and greet spot. <laughs> but when we were done having fun, I found the time to, uh, to do a little bit of reading. It was pretty early on that I went to a public school in Brownsville, and after the first day, um, I was called down to the, the principal's office and told to wait. I didn't remember doing anything uh, inappropriate, or, or I don't remember speaking back or, to, to, or, or talking back to the teacher, but I was summoned to the principal's office and made to wait. And the next thing I know, my mother shows up. My mother had to leave work, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, oh my gosh, what did I do? You know, I'm playing back the, the, the videotape of my mom. <coughs> she goes into the office, and she comes out, and I'm speechless. Mom, what did I do? She said, you didn't do anything. I said, well, why did you have to leave work? Because you can't go to this school anymore. Why can't I go to this school? I just got here. They said that they don't have anything to offer you. That you read above this level and, and whatever. So I, I, felt, I, felt, I felt okay with that. I don't know, in, in, in retrospect, it was probably very cool to be a big fish in a little pond until I was introduced to a bigger pond with big fish as well and they moved me to another school where I had to commute at a very young age, and they entered me into a gifted and talented program. All right, let the fun begin. So here I am with a bunch of other achieving young minds, and we're all competing, we're all competing, and uh, some of the competition, like I said, is not so healthy, probably. So, so you feel the pressure of wanting to do well, especially when you know that you're capable of doing well.
the short of it is that I, I, I did well. I did well enough to reach a point where my guidance counselor at the school called me in one day and said, I want you to consider boarding school. Livid I was. I'm a good kid. You don't need to send me to no boarding school. I didn't break the rules. This is, this is messed up. She let me, she let me go off. Are you done? Yes, I'm done. I didn't say reform school, I said boarding school. <laughs> oh. And she showed me these brochures to these schools that I didn't even know existed. They were colleges, they were college campuses for kids in high school. And at this time in Brooklyn, kids were getting shot in school. Kids are still getting shot in school, unfortunately. In fact, just before this program started, a couple of kids out west, I think, were just shot. My zone school in Brownsville, Brooklyn, was a school named Thomas Jefferson, which had the worst rate of everything, of all the statistics. It was, it was the bottom of the barrel. So if I didn't get into any of my public school choices by public school law in, in, in New York City at the time, you're sent to your zone school. So Thomas Jefferson was my zone school. And I looked at these brochures, manicured lawns, Olympic-sized swimming pools, multiple Olympic-sized swimming pools, <laughs> tracks, and the French language has its own building, the French building. It was very, very impressive. My mother didn't want me to go. I'm a baby. Whoa, but, but there are plenty of good schools here in New York. But mom, this is an opportunity. But you're only 13. You'll be 14 when you leave home. But mom, it's an opportunity. And then she took a trip with me one day to one of those campuses. And she was convinced. She said, apply, you know, and she gave me her blessing. I ended up getting into a school in New Hampshire called Phillips Exeter Academy, which is a, it's a good school. I, uh, I went there for four years. It was culture shock. I'm a kid from Brownsville, Brooklyn. You were taught not to look in anyone's eyes if you don't know them. You were taught not to greet people in Brownsville, Brooklyn. You don't look up at buildings because tourists look up at buildings and tourists are marked and as soon as someone looks up, <laughs> they wake up and their wallet's gone. So I spent, <laughs> All those years, never looking up and never looking at anyone. <laughs> Tunnel vision. So, so imagine my shock when I'm walking down a path, <laughs> my first day at Exeter, and someone I do not know says, hello. <laughs> do I know you? <laughs> and that happened again and again. I must look like somebody that they know. I don't know them. <laughs> until I learned it's okay to say hello to people you don't know. It's okay to, I don't know, it's okay to engage with a stranger. Um, not necessarily take candy from a stranger. <laughs> but you get my drift. Academically, it was really challenging. Um, but I adjusted. We sat around uh, an oval-like table. It was instituted I don't know, probably <laughs> 200 years ago by a guy named John Harkness. That was the method of teaching at Exeter. It was called the Harkness system. There were never any more than 12 of us seated around one of these tables at, at, at the time. And, you, and you, your, your teacher, your professor sat around the table with you. Why is this important? Well, because we occupy a, a, a system of education that's called the banking system by some. As the teacher, I have all the goods. I am the bank. As my students, I give you, I feed you your cash. The more you memorize, the more cash you have. Or the more, mem you, the more you memorize and recite back to me, the more cash you have. So the system is, is a little controversial maybe a lot controversial, because there's 
an inherent condescension in it. And what do I mean by that? The teacher will always be here, and the student will always be here. The Harkness system set out to eradicate that, that difference in power. If I have the floor, if I'm speaking, well, I need to learn, no matter how old I am, the importance of looking at you and addressing you rather than looking at the back of your head or hiding. No, if I have something to say, I'm going to look at you in your face and tell you what I have to say. Sometimes I'm going to be wrong, dead wrong. And it's your job to, uh, to show that to me. So that was really, really valuable and important. Of course, like all things, you know, they say youth is wasted on the young. I completely took it for granted, completely. Until years later, and, and I was reminded of the importance of looking at the, the person I was speaking to. I think I'm going to rap. Why? Because I can. <laughs> I saw the sky part like the red see the world is nervous. I saw the sun cry and bleed, the whole world is getting nervous. I saw my best friend become my enemy, ooh, I'm nervous. Well, everything ain't what it's supposed to be, you should be nervous. I trust no man on face, value, name, or reputation. These are years in my face that came with education. The last of the thinkers have all but died out or else studied the beast of close from inside out. From the streets we came confused, abused creatures suspended in the ether. Students without a teacher, gangs without a leader, aloof as to how we free the mind without the body. Should mobility stop, it just kills me. How the game simply came and went. Yes, I'm guilty for still looking for my name in print. I spent a while out in the whatnots, the joke's on me. I even smiled in my mugshot to catch the moment. How much confusion have oppressors produced this year? The blind know not the difference between truth and fear. As with all things, one day I'll be gone from here. But not before I tell the world that John was here. I saw the sky part like the Red Sea, the world is nervous. I saw the sun cry and bleed, the whole world is getting nervous. I saw my best friend become my enemy, ooh, I'm nervous. Well, everything ain't what it's supposed to be, you should be nervous. Even here, Amongst so many, I stand alone in search of a link between my actions and the way one thinks. Some essence of a connection in a world divided. I'm antithetical to rhetoric, federal propaganda that sends babies to war and tells them fight to the hell of it. You keep insulting my intelligence. Like everyone outside of politics is some nitwit. We'll clash as long as phases of the moon are cyclic. I've seen you entertain your hedonism, greed in your elitism. You told me what I needed on a short list with freedom missing. I've been advised to play by the rules. That's if I ever want to see the light of day in the future. They'd rather see me soft shoe, shuffle in and perform. And you tell my brother I love him. I'll be home by morning. You tell my mothers I'm fine and I'm ever there's dearer. I'm stronger, more determined, and I've never thought clearer. Lock my body, can't trap my mind. Easily explains how I surpassed the time. How much confusion have oppressors produced this year? The blind know not the difference between truth and fear. As with all things, one day I'll be gone from here. But not before I tell the world that John was here. I saw the sky part like the red sea. The world is nervous. I saw the sun cry and bleed. The whole world is getting nervous. I saw my best friend become my enemy. Ooh, I'm nervous. Well, everything ain't what it's supposed to be. You should be nervous. I lost it all, God, just to earn it again. I saw the doors and had to learn to come in. Despite these dudes' intents to ride on my strength and hide what I lent, I can't forget the fact that devils just divided my men and rather unlikely to the psyche. 
The worst devil is the one that looks just like me. Carry on. How much confusion have oppressors produced this year? The blind know not the difference between truth and fear. As with all things, one day I'll be gone from here. But not before I tell the world John was here. I saw the sky part like the red sea. The world is nervous. I saw the sun cry and bleed. The whole world is getting nervous. I saw my best friend become my enemy. Ooh, I'm nervous. Well, everything ain't what it's supposed to be. You should be. Everything ain't what it's supposed to be. You should be. Everything ain't what it's supposed to be. You should be nervous. <laughs> I messed up again. I tried to be cool. <clears throat> All right, left Exeter and came home. I applied to NYU. It was the only school I applied to. And uh, I figured I'd roll the die. The dice. Got the dice. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to let God and nature take over. If I'm meant to go to college, I'll get into NYU. If not, I won't. I got an NYU. So I thought I was meant to go to college until I had an issue with the bursar's office. And he said, you know, you owe this much. I don't have this much. Well, I took that as divine intervention. Aha! I'm not meant to go here after all. <laughs> and I left. Although I lived in the dorm for another couple months. Using a student ID, getting some student food. But I was home, I was, I was back in the thick of things. And I was rapping. My, uh, my roommate, I know, well, at the time, I, I knew him since we were 12. His name is Talib Kweli. And if anybody knows anything about hip hop, you'll know that Talib Kweli is one of the preeminent artists out there right now. He's the James Taylor of hip hop. He is on the road 300 days out of the year. I spoke to him yesterday. Where are you, Fiji? Where are you going tomorrow? Australia? Where are you going tomorrow? London? He's, He's a workhorse. And uh, we, we spent days and nights soaking up lyrics and words. And we were part of a, a, a burgeoning enclave of, of, of the hip hop community called Backpack Rappers. <laughs> and we, we went all over the city with our backpacks and our books and our literature. Did you read this? Did you read this? Because as soon as you read about something, you were going to write a rhyme about it. You were going to put it in just to let people know. Yes, I read. <laughs> I know things. Because you know, reading was cool back then. It was so cool. I, uh, I was invited to a show one day from a friend of mine who said that he possessed the future of hip hop in his hands. And he ran into the room and it was a videotape. I know I'm dating myself, but it was a videotape, a VHS cassette. <laughs> he popped it into the VCR, and he played it. It was a black and white video, two guys, and they were, uh, there was a girl, and the name of the song was Boof Bath, and the name of the group was the Fugees. What the heck does that mean, the Fugees? Oh, he said, it's short, it's short for the refugees, but the, the entire name of the group is Refugees, the Translator Crew. Oh gosh, I'm one of these guys. You know. They have a lot to say, huh? But uh, I went to the show that night. And they were playing instruments. They were running across back and forth. I'm like, who plays instruments? Hip hop, we don't play instruments. We rap, we have a DJ, we beatbox. We don't play instruments. <laughs> but there was something about it. And I said, this is, this is awesome. Well, I had the opportunity after the show to meet the young lady, and her name was and is Lauren Hill. And she had a receiving line waiting for her. We spoke for about 12 minutes. She was in Columbia. I told her I was in NYU. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wasn't. <laughs> but, uh, 
but we bonded, you know, and we became really, really great and incredible friends. Around the same time, I was asked by a record company to, uh, to come in and meet them. Well, I thought that the word was out. I thought my lyrical skills on the mic <laughs> finally got me some notoriety from the biz. And I walked in and uh, there were three young guys, all recent graduates of Harvard. Brian Brader, Jarrett Meyer, and a young guy named James Murdoch, son of Rupert Murdoch. Rupert owns everything. In any event. <laughs> so I'm sitting there with my ego on my back, waiting for them to make me an offer. Here are three young white guys from the suburbs who are in the thick of New York City and they want to start a hip hop label. I'm like, oh, I know you want me to be the flagship artist. You really liked my skills, you heard about me. He said, well, we did hear about you, but we don't want to sign you as an artist. What? You don't want to sign me? Why, why am I here? We want you to be our director of A&R, which is artist and repertoire. I said, you want me to sign people to the, to the label? Well, we know you know everyone. We know you know all of the underground rappers in New York, and you can, you can get us to them. I went home, I said, Mom, I got offered a job by the son of Rupert Murdoch, among other people. It's a paycheck, and, and it's a good one. And I'm 19, and I'm the director of a and of a record company. I have a title. And my mother, she encouraged me. She said, go for it, see where it takes you. So, I went around the country, going to music conferences, going state to state, finding new talent and uh, signing them to record deals. Substantial money. $100,000 contract here, $150,000 contract here. I'm 19. I'm wearing a suit and a tie now and a little briefcase. I'm, 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 I'm seeing my friends rapping in the park. You know, they see me coming and, and it's no longer John Forte the rapper, it's John Forte, he works at Raucous. Well, after my artists, because they were my artists, even though some of them were twice my age, they were, they were, they were my, my, my babies. After they left the studio at night, I would stick around and, <laughs> and entertain my dream. You know, I'd turn the lights down, go into the vocal booth, and make some hip hop records. But it was a very surreptitious existence, you know, very down low. But Lauren and I, we, we were becoming great friends, and, and, and I let her hear the music I was making. Well. Fuji's uh, the first album didn't do so well, but with the help of a last single, uh, it was a remix by a producer named Salam Remy, uh, and, and the song was called Nappy Heads. I won't be too specific, but the song got a lot of traction on the radio airwaves. Enough for Sony to say, we're gonna renew your contract and we're gonna give you guys another shot at it. So Lauren called me up and she says, John, I, I want you to come to the studio. I want you to play for the group, what, what you've been playing for me. I said, what? I said, I'm an executive. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not an artist. <laughs> Look at my card. I'm the director of A&R of Rockets Entertainment. <laughs> I don't sign deals. I make them. You know, I'm, I was, oh, yes. Was, I was doing that. And she was like, whatever. I'll see you Tuesday night. Okay. <laughs> so I went to the studio with my cassettes, audio cassettes. <laughs> and, uh, and why Clef? turned to me and he said, man, I'm really liking these tracks, especially this one. And I said, well, if you like that track, you should do a rap on it like this. And then I rapped and he said, you rap too? I said, yeah, I rap a little bit. So he says, man, you, 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 gotta, you gotta be on this record. I said, no, nah, I'm an executive. I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> so about two hours later, I'm on the record and uh, <laughs> And, and, and one record becomes a couple, becomes a few, and I, and I end up producing and co-producing and writing on what would become one of the biggest hip-hop albums in, in history. I went back to Raucous one Monday morning, briefcase in hand, tie, tie, forehand, Windsor, whatever. Ah. <laughs> can always spot them, my colleague, hello, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, 
And James looks at me and says, John, what's, what's, what's the matter? Nothing, nothing, I'm fine. He says, I read in the New York Times that the Fugees are getting ready to go on a, a tour. Yeah, I heard something about that. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, uh, did they ask you to go? They did, but I'm, I'm, I'm an executive. I've got, <laughs> I've got an obligation here. I've signed a contract. James says to me, he says, John, go. And if it doesn't work out, you can always come back. <laughs> out of the door, dust on my heels, I was gone. And I, and I went to see the world with the Fugees. So we go to the San Remo film, we go to the San Remo festival, and I look out, and I could barely see the stage. Why? Because it was usurped by the number of people looking at the stage. 500,000 people. I get on stage, I'm singing my verse. They know the words to my song. There is no feeling in the world quite like 500,000 people serenading you as you serenade them. Unfortunately, what I lacked in that moment was proper perspective because you couldn't tell me anything after that. I had 500,000 people saying my lyrics. I am the man. The world owes me. And I was a jerk. It was time for me to come out with my solo album. I recorded. I said I'm going to do it on my own. My producers, my way. I'm gonna use my formula. Why? Because I'm a genius. I know what I'm doing. 500,000 people know the words to my song. I just sold 22 million records with the Fugees and 8 million with Wyclef. I'm gonna kill it. My album comes out. I'm signed to Sony. Critical acclaim. Rolling Stone saying good things about me. New York Times, whoa. I named the album Poly Sci. P-O-L-Y hyphen S-C-I, the many sciences, because I wanted to marry the science of academia with the science of the street. Let me bring my education to the world. <laughs> Let me be pedantic. Mm. <clears throat> the album comes out and it sells less than 100,000 copies. By today's standards, to sell 100,000 of anything in the music business is, is, is a huge coup. But back then, it's what we poetically refer to as a brick. I went up to the label, I screamed at everyone. Product managers, promo people, marketing people, you don't know how to do your job. At 19, I was doing your job. I, I was, what? Like around a conference table. Bile coming out of my, ah. They sat, listened, just like my guidance counselor so many years ago. Are you done? Yeah, I'm done. You're no longer an artist at Sony Records. Good luck. <laughs> you dropped me? With all this talent, you dropped me? I guess word had circulated through the industry because at that point, no one wanted to sign me. And I said, well, you know what? I don't need anyone. I'm going to do this on my own. At this point in my life, I was pretty much hurting. The universe has a funny way of offering you what you want when you think you want it most. And that opportunity came in the way of a flamboyant, opulent sort of fellow that I met. I'd be in the club and he'd show up and he'd have his, his Bentley outside on a Monday and then he'd come back the next day and he'd have his Rolls Royce outside. Wow, man, this, whoever this guy is, he's, he's doing something right. Or was he? Well, he offered me something, all right? He offered me an opportunity to fund my next project. And I justified it by saying, yeah, I'm, I'm creating. Here's a means to an end that will allow me to further my art. Well, what was that? It was involving myself in a criminal enterprise. But not so much. I said, no, I'm just going to do a little bit, just enough to, to earn a tiny commission. But I don't need to know the details. Because if the house of cards ever falls, hey, man, I'm a rapper. I don't, I don't know much. Well, <laughs> I 
fact, I really didn't know much. <laughs> because in 2001, at my trial, when the House of Cards fell, the first thing the jury told, the first thing the judge told the jury was, willful blindness is not a valid defense. <laughs> what? I said, my, willful blindness is when you pretend to not know of something that you probably do know. <laughs> But that's my defense. <laughs> no. No. And uh, the interesting thing was, I figured I'd do the honorable thing. I'm not going to testify against anyone. I'm not going to implicate anyone else because, well, this is my crime. This is what, this is what I did. So, a lot of people testified. And they all testified against me. <laughs> so whereas I thought I was a minion on the totem pole, <laughs> where were the drugs going? To John Forte, that man right there. <laughs> so on September the 6th, 2001, I was sentenced. Actually, I was found guilty. I was sentenced a couple of months later in November. And, and ultimately sentenced to 168 months in a federal prison. 14 years for a first time nonviolent drug offense. That's it's debatable, I know, and it's, it's also controversial to refer to a, a drug offense as nonviolent. So I'm, th that's not lost on me. Drugs do hurt people, and, and there are different forms of violence. So you won't, you won't get that, uh, you won't get me arguing that. I think sometimes you can look at a person and cause violence to their, their aura or their person. But here I am, September the 6th, 2001. Oh, by the way, I went to trial in Texas because that's where the nature of the conspiracy began. When I asked to have some time home so that I can settle my affairs, the uh, the prosecutor said I was a flight risk and, and I needed to be detained immediately. September the 6th, 2001. Five days later, I'm in my bunk, minding my business, trying to ponder the gravity of, of what has just taken place. And someone knocks on my cell. <laughs> yep. Hey, little homie. Uh, you need to come to the TV. No, 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 I don't watch TV. You want to see this? No, no, it's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't watch television. New York is on fire. I said, what? Jumped out of the rack. Got the little headphones. And I saw what happened at the World Trade Center. Of course, I walk in just like everyone else, and I saw the second plane hit. So here I am in Houston, Texas, far away from home, looking at a lot of time and thinking that my home, that there might not be anything to return to. I'm calling home, I'm calling my mom, I'm calling anybody that I know and I couldn't get through because all the phone lines were, were busy. Well, that was the beginning of <coughs> An incarnation. An incarnation of incarceration. I just saw the light bulb it was a Eureka moment. I'm like, write that down. I didn't want to be what's known as the freak at the table. You know that person that gets invited to the dinner party to be the center of attraction because he's got a story to tell? And he thinks that he's among friends, but he doesn't realize that he's actually the joke of, of the conversation. Or at least he's being used as, as the fodder to keep people coming back to dinner. Because next week there'll be another freak at the table. So I knew that I was entering into the system with some celebrity. And rightfully so. I had inmates coming up to me saying, man, why? <coughs> why? And this was a question I had not asked myself. Why did you take the risk? You're clearly a bright guy. You had success, you know people. 
I had to do what I had to do. I dropped out of school. I have eight siblings. I have a couple of children. I don't have any skills. I had, to, I had to hold those corners down. You did not have, why are you here? I don't know. I thought I could get away with it. I thought I was above reproach. And that began this, this phase of, of, of self-reflection. And I didn't need other people to ask me why anymore. Because I spent the next number of years asking myself that question. The Socratic method, the, the, the Delphic model, know thyself. I spent so many years in this imaginary world getting to know a world without ever attempting to know myself. My girlfriend at the time, baby, there's no way you're gonna do 14 years. And the appellate attorney say that the appeal looks great. They've got a, 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 they've got a case. And I'm investing in that. I'm not talking about music. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not writing music. I've turned my back on that world. People will ask me stuff about, hey, you know Puff? No, I don't know anybody. You know Jay-Z? I don't know anybody. And I went to the law library. Because someone told me that no one knows your case the way you know your case. And no matter how good your attorney is, you know your case, and you can get yourself out. So, looking at case law, learning about case law, learning how to shepherdize, looking and learning about simple facts, like if I was pulled over, I could actually say, no, you don't have the right to search my vehicle. I had no idea. I watch TV. Can we search it? Of course. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh. So, file for appeal. It's my, um, oh gosh, I, I, I tell this story, not, not, necessarily, not necessarily in this order. Um, a writ of cert, my 2250, oh, it's my direct, sorry. So it's my direct appeal first. I'm looking at it, man. Call it cognitive dissonance or whatever. I'm looking at this case and I'm saying, man, this looks great. There's nobody, there's no way that anybody with the brain will look at this and will, will keep me here. Oh well. <laughs> Somebody with the brain looked at it and said, denied. <laughs> oh. And I sent my writ of cert up to the Supreme Court. I'm in the law library one day and I'm looking at the uh, criminal law reporter. Hey, John, man. Your case made it. What? My case is listed in the criminal law reporter. They're looking at a, 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 a was it a Sixth Amendment issue? A, no, a, 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 a privacy. They were looking at a privacy issue on my case. It's mentioned. Man, this is huge. A few months later, denied. Well, I have one more shot. My direct appeal. This is gonna, this is gonna be good. You know why? Because the kingpin on my case recanted his testimony. We have a 38-page affidavit with him saying that I was left in the dark. That he left me in the dark intentionally because he never wanted me to know the inner workings of the operation. And the only reason why he said what he said is because he got a deal. The introduction of new evidence. That'll get me back in front of the judge. Ah, his testimony is no longer valid. Well, that's about it. Because by this time, six years have elapsed. And my girlfriend's gone. Most of my friends have moved on. And it's pretty difficult for people to come and see me. So the visits, the visits get fewer and far between. The interesting thing, though, is that the mail, the mail never slowed down for me. And not from people I knew. I'd be there on a Tuesday, I'm talking about a low day for me. And I'm thinking, man, I've really done it now. This is, it's, it's over. Mail call, Forte! Okay, pass the letter back. Japan, who do I know in Japan? Hi, right, John, I want you to know that I have um, your sophomore album, Hi, right, John, and your song, How Could I, was my wedding song. 
And on every anniversary, my wife and I, we do, we, we dance to your music. I'm not there, but the music lived on. The music, my child had a life of its own. So the appeals are gone. And I'm looking at my calendar and saying, I've got about eight more years here to do. My friend, my mentor, my spiritual godmother, Carly Simon, was perhaps the, the loudest crusader that I had in my corner. Carly would come out with an album, and she'd be on the Today Show. So tell us about your album. Free John Forte! <laughs> <laughs> I'd call her up afterwards. <laughs> Mama C, what are you, you got an album to promote. She says, no, it's just not right. The punishment does not fit the crime. It's unacceptable. Every day, she, she's calling, she's writing, she's marching with others on, on Washington, she's linking up with Families Against Mandatory Minimums, November Coalition, you name it, she's, she's out there. and trying to garner me some, some attention. But in the meantime, two big things happen at this, at this point. A friend of mine comes to me one day from the recreation department. John, you're never gonna believe what I got for you. What, a Monopoly game? <laughs> Even better, a guitar, here. Shows me this acoustic guitar. Well, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah, man, play it. You know, you're a musician. Uh, nah, that's cool. You give it to somebody else. He thought he was doing me a favor because, well, my friends all played the guitar. What he didn't realize was that I had no idea how to play the guitar. But he kept pressing. Here, take it. <laughs> Fine, I'll take it, just to get him out of my hair. A lot of hair. <laughs> And I look at this thing. Day in and day out, it's, it's creaking. It, I pushed it underneath the, the, the bunk. You know, how oh, it's still there. Until finally, I, I, I call some friends of mine. Can you guys send me in some books? All right, what do you want this time? Give me the basic guitar guide for dummies uh, and idiots guitar guide for guitar, whatever. <laughs> So they send in these, these guitar books, how to teach yourself how to play. So at night, in my cell, F, 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 A minor, A minor, A minor, F, F, John. What? Look, man, it's two in the morning, man. I like you, but you, that's enough. That's cool. Then there's a crackdown, and the administration st starts taking things from us. And every week, we, something was taken away from us. A certain soap off the commissary, or pants, or something. It's just like every week, they're just taking stuff. I didn't care. I, I tried to channel my, my inner zen. I have no attachments. Until they said, that guitar's got to go. There's no way you can keep that guitar in. What? I'm learning. I went to the recreation department. Look, I'm staying out of trouble. I'm programming. I'm, I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I'm focused. I want to learn. Let me. All right. Look. Um. If you teach a class, you can keep it. Can I teach a class. I don't even know how to play the thing. <laughs> I said, okay, bet. <laughs> I learned two chords on a Monday. Those are the two chords I'm teaching on a Friday. <laughs> And that went on for years. <laughs> By this time, friends and family were asking me about the music. Well, are you writing? 
and I end up writing new songs. But there are no recording devices in prison. So the only way that I can share the music with my loved ones is to write it down. So I reintroduced myself to the theory that I'd almost forgotten, and I started notating music again. Well, one day they came through on a shakedown, they being staff, administration, saw this music paper. What are you, what are you doing with this music paper? I'm, I'm writing music. No, 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 I, we, 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 no, 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 because my friends were sending in blank music paper. But they said, we can't have you sending in blank, we don't know. The, like, what am I gonna do with blank music paper? Yeah. <laughs> Went to recreation, I got blank music paper. Look, the only way I can justify you having it is if you teach a class. <laughs> 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 All right, fine. I'm teaching Music Theory 101. And I'm about Music Theory 202, so. <laughs> so my students are bearing with me, but I'm telling them, oh man, God forgive me for leading some of them down the wrong path. I'm sure there was some stuff I said on, on, on a Friday that was just wrong. <laughs> but they trusted me. And I got used to this, this idea of teaching and, and, and being an instructor. And it was so rewarding. Guys, you've never thought about picking up the guitar or learning how to read or write music because now they can put cool stuff in their letters and they can say, hey baby, I wrote this melody for you. And they meant it. In 2006, I filed for executive clemency. I'd since forgotten about it, not thinking that it was it was ever even realistic, but it was a slim, slim ray of hope. On November the 24th, 2008, while I was sitting there studying for an exam, a friend comes up to me and says, hey, you wanna come watch TV? I said, I don't watch TV. <laughs> he says, you might wanna see this. I said, why? He says, the president, it was President Bush at the time, he said he's on TV giving out pardons and commutations. Pew! <laughs> I went to the phones and I, I called my attorney one of my attorneys at the time. And I heard this sort of ambience, like she was, uh, uh, the ambient noise, like she was out at a, uh, a restaurant. And she says, John, did, did you hear anything? I said, I heard that, this was at 6 p.m. I said, I heard that the president was on TV handing out pardon and commutations. She said, your name is on that list. And I fell silent. And I said, thank you. I hung up the phone. And I saw one of my dear friends, Ramel, and I said, Rob, I said, I'm, I'm going home. He said, yeah, I know, baby, we all going home. I said, <laughs> I said, said Rob, I'm going home. Like, my sentence was just commuted. I will be home within 30 days. And um, on December the 22nd, 2008, with uh, almost seven years left to a sentence, I, I came home after serving a little more than seven years in a federal prison. Mm. I will never tell you how to live. I will never tell you what to do with your life. But I will say this, the grass is not always greener on the other side. No, 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 please, please, don't, please. And, I'm, and I'm, I, I never reject applause. But that's just something I want the babies to chew on. There are few in here, just, just chew on. With that being said, thank you to the Danville Regional Foundation. Thank you to all of you for being so patient with me and, and this guitar. And uh, my name is John Forte, God bless.